Good morning. Hi, welcome to the April I Realize brunch for payroll and reward professionals. This is our opportunity to share thoughts and knowledge for your benefit on a range of topics. So my name is Ian Holloway and um, we're going to be focusing the brunches as we go through 2021 and onwards on what you tell us you want to discuss. And it's a very much a two way process. We want you to share your thoughts and experiences on topics with us as well as us feeding back to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. This month, I'm joined by Steve Herbert, Head of Benefits Strategy at Howden Employee Benefits and Wellbeing. And as we were discussing earlier on, we've known each other for probably more years than we want to um, admit to. But I regularly attend the Howden Employment Seminars um, where uh, Steve speaks. And the one I attended in March this year was particularly interesting and relevant to what you've told us you want to, to discuss. And it's all to do with the very real situation that we're in at the moment, i.e. we're in the midst of a pandemic, employment has changed and will change employment going forward, perhaps forever. So what do employers and employees have to be mindful of as we emerge into a new, a new normal? And on that point, I want to hand over to Steve, but please do pop, it, pop in any comments, any questions in the chat box at the bo bottom. We've got some poll questions at the end of Steve's um, uh, presentation, but I'll hand over to Steve and um, I will block myself out. Good morning. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Ian. So my presentation today is called The Road to Normality, and it is very much a reality check, I think, of where we are. Now, when I'm talking about the road to normality, I'm, of course, talking about Boris Johnson's statement about the roadmap, which you could also call a timetable. I think most of us would call it a timetable, but for some reason he chose to call it a roadmap to how we escape the current set of restrictions. And I appreciate the different devolved governments have got slightly different roadmaps. But broadly speaking, we're all on much the same path with much the same time frame ahead of us. Now, for those interested, we're about halfway along that roadmap. We've passed the first couple of markers. We're just past that dark orange marker in the middle. We've reopened some of the economy in the last few weeks. We're reopening a lot more in a couple of weeks time. And there is the ambition that in less than two months now, so it's within touching distance, we may get back to some sort of normality. Now, I would caveat that with actually, I suspect there will still be some restrictions regardless of what's being said, albeit some sort of social distancing, some sort of mask wearing, whatever. But we may come back to that later on in the question and answers. But I don't think it will be full normality, but we, by God, we need to get there, let's be honest. Uh, as individuals, as businesses, as nations, we cannot carry on with this boom or bust of opening up, closing restrictions, et cetera, because eventually we're all break. And again, that may be individuals, that may be companies, but we just can't carry on like that. So the good news is the vaccine's working. The good news is it's reducing deaths and it's also reducing, and we've had that confirmed this week, transmission. So it feels like the UK is in a good place for that roadmap, but I think it would be a mistake to actually conclude that just we're out of the woods now. Because the truth of the matter is COVID is incredibly widespread. Particularly if you bear in mind, this is, disease was only discovered 18 months ago. So in no time at all, it's spread around the world. This particular shot was taken from the BBC website this week. The bigger the circle, the more the infection rate over the last 14 months. Your eye, I'm sure, would have been drawn to the United States of America. They've had, well, more than half a million deaths last month and now about 570,000 deaths in the USA, but they have now got a handle on things in the same way the UK has. Uh, under Biden, they've got the vaccination program rolling out and they're actually almost at the same level we, as we are in the UK per 100 people. So America's getting a grip on things and looking forwards now. Drop south from North America into South America, loads of problems in South America with COVID, most notably Brazil, where their president just refuses, even now to take it seriously. They've had more than 400,000 deaths in Brazil and that figure is going up and up and they're in danger of the entire healthcare system collapsing in Brazil. Come across to Africa, and on the face of it, Africa doesn't look too badly affected by COVID. Yes, there's COVID there from those small dots you can see, but not large dots, not large breakouts. But that's probably only because Africa is very, very poor in large parts. So they're probably not testing, they're probably not recording the cases, but they're almost certainly there in huge numbers. Come across to India and of course those tragic stories we've heard over the last week or so. In one 72 hour period at the weekend, there were more than a million positive COVID cases in India, just one three day period. So the truth of the matter is, India is about to get much, much worse and their healthcare system has already collapsed, as is quite clear from the news stories we're all hearing. Uh, go past Turkey, coming back towards Europe. Turkey is just about to go into another lockdown 
and come up to Europe, lots of geographically small countries, but with big COVID problems. The whole of Europe, including the UK, has handled the whole pandemic rather badly, is the truth. Why am I telling you all this? Well, I'm telling you this for one simple reason. COVID is no longer an epidemic. It stopped being that a year ago. It is no longer a pandemic because it's been that for some time. What it really is now, if we're being honest about it, is it's endemic. It is in the world population. It is in the UK population. And that means it ain't going anywhere soon, folks. So when you hear politicians, as they were only two months ago, glibly talking about zero COVID in the UK, it isn't going to happen anytime soon. And the problem with it being so endemic in the world's population is the damn thing is going to keep doing what viruses do. It's going to keep mutating. We've already had the Kemp variant and the Brazilian variant and the South African variant and the double Indian variant and even the treble Indian variant rolling out. And there'll be many more in the months and years ahead. So there will be a constant threat from COVID for a time to come. But the good news is, as Professor Sharon Peacock recently said, at some point, we, the human race, will get on top of COVID. We will sort it out. And that may be through vaccines in isolation, although I suspect not. And we may come back to discuss Chile right at the end. There's an interesting case study about the country of Chile, uh, which is worth looking at. So it may be through vaccines. It may be through vaccines and other measures like mask wearing, social distancing. It may be those plus a new thing that we haven't discovered yet, a new medical advance that changes the game. But at some point we will get on top of COVID or, and this is equally possible, COVID will mutate itself to a point where it is no longer dangerous. It is benign to human race in the same way that the common cold is no longer really dangerous to the human race. So one of those two things will happen at some point. But she did then go on to say, and rather spoil the, the positive message, that actually this could be 10 years down the line. So the reality check before we move any further is that actually we have no choice, folks. I know none of us will really want to accept this. We want this to think that actually normality is within touching distance, that everything will be fine. And I really hope it is, and I'm sure you do too. But we've got to learn to live with it because COVID is here and it's certainly here for the foreseeable future. What we have to do as individuals, what we have to do as employers is find a way of working around it and moving forward. And that's much what my last part of my presentation is about. But before I move towards that part of the presentation, I also want to flag that it's not just COVID that we have to worry about. Of course, we have all those existing health threats that we knew about anyway. They're still there. In fact, many of them have been made worse by the delay of COVID over the last year or so. Lots of things haven't been treated, haven't been diagnosed, etc. So that, that's all there. But there are other new health threats that we need to be aware of. We must be aware of and we must be prepared for. You hear politicians, you hear the media trot out regularly that COVID is a once in a century epidemic or a once in a century pandemic. And certainly if you drew a rough, very rough timeline of the UK over the last 100 years, it would be bookended, if you like, by the Spanish flu just after the First World War and at the other end after end COVID-19. So it does look like COVID is a once in a century experience and we won't have to worry about this until next century. But actually, it's not true. There are always new health threats coming. And even in the last 100 years, there have been several. I'm going to highlight two in this presentation that you may have heard about in the past, but I'm pretty sure most people won't know anything about in particular. One was the Asian flu epidemic of 1957. And just 11 years later, there was the Hong Kong flu pandemic of 1968, which actually was the year I was born in fact. So that's immediately you can see from this timeline that to say this is a once in a century occurrence is wrong. It is already more regular than that. Now, in terms of the, the scores on the doors, the damage that these different flus did to the UK population, well, it varies significantly. By far the most damaging, as it currently stands at least, was the Spanish flu, which incidentally had nothing to do with Spain. It's just where it was first identified. But the Spanish flu in the UK accounted for around 200,000 deaths. Some figures have it as high as 240,000 deaths. A huge hit on a much, much smaller population. Like all of these flus and disease, it did affect, of course, those people that were more vulnerable the most, the very elderly, the people with underlying conditions. And that's always the way. But it was a much more mixed bag of ages than we're seeing in terms of deaths with COVID. So move forward from the Spanish flu to the Asian flu epidemic of 1957. It was a much smaller death toll, 33,000. But, and it's an important but, it was different to the others. It spread during the summer months, which these things generally don't do. It spread predominantly through children and younger aged adults. 
And that's where I really want to pause because although all of these things did kill the older generation, in the case of Asian flu, it actually took a huge toll of children, babies, uh, young pregnant ladies and the like. And the result of that was we actually had a big loss of life from the younger generations. Now, any loss of life is regrettable, is awful and all the rest of it. And if you've lost someone in the last year, of course you have my sympathy. It's been horrible, the whole thing. But I think we'd all, if we took a step back, except that the loss of a child's life seemed worse. And yet, despite a great number of that 33,000 being children, we as a nation have chosen to forget about Asian flu, which I just find amazing. Today, it will be replaying all the time that we've lost children to a pandemic. So that was the Asian flu. The Hong Kong flu, which again, most people won't know anything about, and I didn't, and it was the year I was born, and I still didn't know anything about it. 80,000 UK deaths of mixed ages, and our friend COVID-19, or when I first put this slide together, which was back in mid-January, I think the figure there was 72,000. I've updated it several times for several different presentations since. It's now 127,000, and that's at the lower estimate. The higher figure is about 150,000 UK deaths. And that's where we are now, and there may still be another wave ahead. So all of those have been tragic and horrible, but they do demonstrate it is more than a once in a century experience. Worth pausing here. You may be looking at these figures and thinking, well, 127,000 is horrible, it's tragic, and all the rest of it. But actually, it's less bad than the Spanish flu, and it wasn't that much worse than the Hong Kong flu. But that's 127,000 deaths, despite everything we as a nation, and indeed everything the world did, to try and restrict it. Despite lockdowns and restrictions and tears, social distancing, mask wearing, universal healthcare, which we certainly didn't have 100 years ago and medical advances. Not only the last 100 years worth of medical advances, but the last 12 months. 12 months ago, the prospect of getting a vaccine that was ready to go and even going into any arms by this time was thought ludicrous. Yet here we are with half the UK population vaccinated, which is an incredible achievement. So the truth of the matter is, despite all of that, we still got 127,000 deaths. Had we not done that, we would be in the same situation as Brazil, the same situation as India we would have a collapsing healthcare system and that figure would have been magnified many, many times. So although it's been a horrible year and I completely get it as, um, I've had enough and I'm sure you have too, we've done the right things to try and save lives. But we do need to move beyond that and we do need to understand the health threats that may also be coming from other sources. So COVID's the one that's washed up. COVID's the one that we felt in the UK. But if you look at the last 20 years, so just since the turn of this century, there have been all of those health threats to the world. SARS, MERS, Ebola, avian influenza. These things caused chaos in the Far East. These things caused problems in Africa. They just didn't really get to the UK shores. COVID-19 did, and we've seen what damage that does to an economy and to a people, and indeed, of course, in terms of deaths as well. And the truth is that these health threats are very much on the rise. Four times in the last 100 years, three times just in the last 40. So we know this is becoming more common. Why is that? Well, no one knows for sure, of course, but it does feel pretty likely that it's about the pressures that we as a race are putting on the planet. Just in my lifetime alone, the population of the world has gone from 3.7 billion to more than double in just 50 years to 7.8 billion. Straight away, you can see there's a problem there. We're getting more and more people packed onto the same amount of land, the same planet, if you like. And if we've got double the population, we've also got double the livestock to feed that population. And that's problematical. The more people we get close together, the, the easier transmission is. The more livestock we have, the more chances there are of back, oh, sorry, viruses occurring in livestock that is then transferring to humans. And then we are spreading around the world. And in terms of spreading things around the world, well, air travel back in 1970, there were 310 million passengers in that year. If you roll forward to 2019, not 2020, because no one flew anywhere last year, but 2019, the last full year of air travel before the pandemic, and we go from 310 million passengers to quite astonishing 4.4 billion air passengers. And every single one of those passengers can transmit a virus hundreds or thousands of miles in just a few hours. So when I go back to that world map, that's why it's so widespread because things move so much faster than they ever did, before, ever did before, which is why we need to be on the alert and have good plans to protect our employees, to protect our business going forward. The final factor, which may or may not be there, but it's certainly something that's worth considering, is global warming. You could argue about the causes of global warming, and people do, 
but you can't really deny that it's actually happening. The last decade was the hottest decade on record. The last six years have been the hottest six years on record. So global warming is certainly happening and maybe adding to this problem, if you like. The bottom line of all of this is exactly as Professor Matthew Bailey said last year, this is not the last pandemic we are going to face. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to have one next year or even next decade, but the chances are another one will make it here sooner rather than later. So whether it's a new health threat or whether it's a resurgence of COVID, and it has to be said, the Prime Minister is openly talking about a third wave now. I've seen at least three different quotes from him about a potential third wave in the summer and autumn of this year. There are likely to be more health threats that we need to manage as employers. Now, before I move on to what we can do about that, I do just want to pick up something that I think is important, and I don't think is being understood enough by employers. And that's about COVID-19 outcomes, because we're always being told that basically COVID is a binary outcome. You either survive, and happily that's the vast majority of people, or you die, which is a very small percentage, but still lots and lots of people, as we've already established. But it isn't really true. And finally, the media are catching up with this. It's taken them a long time. Finally, politicians are starting to talk about it, at least a bit. I've been writing on this subject for a long time, because the truth is, for every single COVID-19 death we see, according to Professor Callum Semple of SAGE, there is likely to be four or five people who survive COVID, but are damaged by COVID. And damaged, I know is an emotive word, and I, I've only got his word, and that's what, that's what it is. I don't exactly know what, know what he means by that. He probably doesn't himself yet. But that means there are a lot of people that actually are surviving, but have been damaged, have got problems from having had that COVID experience. The supporting evidence is already becoming quite compelling too. The ONS looked at the four weeks ending the 6th of March and found that more than a million people in the UK actually were experiencing long COVID conditions. So what is long COVID? Well, names clues in the name, it is an extension of COVID symptoms, but it's nowhere near that straightforward. There have already been identified 205 different symptoms connected to long COVID. And here's the real kicker. You can have one set of symptoms and be recovering only to go down with an entirely new set of symptoms. There are lots of unknowns about long COVID. You know, COVID itself has only been with us for 18 months. Long COVID by definition has been with us for less time. So the truth is we don't know much about it, but we do know that it can be incredibly debilitating, an incredible problem for people who are experiencing it. And we also know that actually, unlike its more morbidity cousin, if you like, long COVID is very much an equal opportunities virus. It doesn't just target the elderly, it doesn't care who you are. You can be young, you can be old, you can be male, you can be female, you can have any sort of ethnic background, you could have been really, really healthy before the pandemic and still get long COVID. There are marathon runners, there are sprinters, people that are really top athletes who have got long COVID and now can't walk up a flight of stairs. So it can be really, really bad news. And it doesn't even matter whether you had severe COVID initially or not. You could have had a very mild case of COVID. You could have had no particular problem at all and still have long COVID conditions. So the truth of the matter is this is really possibly widespread around the working population of the UK. And we're here as employers today as the working population I want to focus on. And that means that long COVID could very easily be in your workforce, regardless of what your workforce makeup is. Because as I say, long COVID doesn't care it would hit anyone at any age. In fact, some recent figures I saw even suggested children are getting long COVID as well. I don't think in many numbers yet, but that's because children generally aren't really experiencing a problem with COVID, but that could change. So long COVID could easily be in your workforce. And if you take nothing else from my presentation today, and I fully accept you may not, but please, please go away and have a think about whether you've got a long COVID problem in your workforce. If you've got people on furlough at the moment, and I'm sure at least some in the call today have, how would you know if they've got long COVID? They probably won't be putting up their hand to tell you because they're getting 80% of their salary from the government. But if they go on to sick pay, it could well be a lot less than 80% of their salary. So why would they tell you? Plus they probably also don't want to risk actually that counting against them should a redundancy exercise happen in the future. And I can't blame them. Likewise, if you've got people working at home, and despite some of the easements, I'm expecting pretty much most people on the call today are working from home, as I am myself. If you've got people working from home, how would you know if they got long COVID unless they told you? They might be able to do some work, enough to at least be sort of covering the bases and deliver on some of their KPIs, but you might not know that they got long COVID. 
But when you try and bring those people back to a physical workplace, when you have the nine to five and all commuting and everything that goes with it, a lot of people won't be able to do that. So at least establish whether you've got problems in your workforce with long COVID. And if you have direct your employee benefits you've got in place to try and support them or look at other options to support them. The earlier you help these people, the more likely they can get back and get productive, which is what we all need. As soon as we return to any sort of normality, we all need to be back to as close to as maximum productivity as we can possibly achieve. But let's go back to managing the risks. So I'm sure all of you have already got a COVID-19 secure poster tacked up on the wall, ready for the return to work, or if you're already back, for the people that have returned to physical workplace. This is the government's own policy, if you like, the framework, but I don't think it's enough. I think it needs to be bigger and I think it needs to be better. COVID secure, well, yes, it's a framework we can build on, but I think you need to have something that's much more infection secure. So be it a resurgence of COVID or be it one of those other health threats that may come through in the future, we hope they don't, but they may do. Let's have something that we can use really quickly to protect our employees, to protect our businesses. And I think there will be a lot of pressure as the dust settles on this wave of the pandemic to have a really robust policy in place. Not from the government necessarily, but from your supply chain, from your clients and from your suppliers, because they will want to see you as a hygiene factor doing the right thing around your business and your employees, because that will extend to them doing the right thing around their clients and their suppliers and their employees. So actually, I think there's kind of become a real hygiene factor, certainly in some sectors of the economy, that you have a really robust infection secure place uh, policy in place to protect your business, to protect your employees and to protect everyone they deal with. Likewise, insurers have been really hard hit by the last year. Of course they have been, all this business interruption and everything else. So it's likely that they will look more favorably on companies that are doing the right things to minimize the risk, to mitigate the problems of a future pandemic or a third surge of COVID or whatever it may be. So actually doing the right thing now will put you in a better place to get the best insurance premiums going forward. And finally, of course, unions, employee representatives, employees themselves, will want and not unreasonably expect employers to do the right thing, to have policies in place that protect people when they go to work, because that's really, really important too. And all of this also comes back to reputational risk. So I'm going to give you a quick case study around sick pay now, because this shows you what happens if you get these things wrong. This shows you what it can do to a business going forward. Very much a real life example, excuse me, I'll take a quick slug of tea, excuse me, which is based on just local news reports in my area. No names, no pack drills. I've simplified it a bit for the purposes of this presentation, but it shows you why having good policy in place is just so, so important. Now, this was a food production company, a food production factory, in fact, uh, with around 300 staff. And because they were in food production, they were open right the way through all the lockdowns because of what they do. Now, their policy on COVID was set at the beginning, and it was this. We will pay sick pay, which we don't normally do, but we will pay sick pay to our employees if they have a positive COVID-19 test, which is not an unreasonable policy at the starting point. But if you just cast your mind back to last autumn, we had what was essentially a testing scandal in the UK, where people couldn't get tested or were sent hundreds of miles sometimes to receive a test. And even when they did get a test, it sometimes took two, four, six, eight, ten days to get the result back. Now that's fine if you're receiving sick pay, but if you're not receiving sick pay until you've got your positive or negative COVID test, that's a different matter altogether. Now these people were relatively low paid, they've got families to put food on the table for, they did the logical thing. They couldn't stay off work with no income for a week or more. They went to work. They probably shouldn't have, they probably knew they probably shouldn't have, but they got to put food on the table, they got to get an income. So they went to work, and that led to rising infections in this particular workplace, which inevitably, as I'm sure you'd understand, in such a small factory type environment, led to an increase in sickness absence, particularly around COVID. And tragically, for such a small workforce, it also led to three employee deaths. All because the policies that the company had in place at the start didn't help employees to help the employer, and in the process, help themselves and their families too because that's what happens if you get this wrong, folks. And we don't want to keep being in this sort of scenario going forward. The truth of the matter is for that employer, aside from the loss of their employees, which is always horrible in any workplace, as I'm sure we all appreciate, their reputational damage is hideous. 
They've been reported many times on the local news. So that's a bad start for your reputation. Clients and suppliers are probably going to be reluctant to deal with them in the future because it's exposing their employees and their clients and suppliers to risks. The local workforce probably won't want to work for them. Their employees probably don't trust them. Their reputation is trashed as well as the loss of their employees and everything that goes with it. So actually getting a good policy, a robust policy in place is every bit in your interest as an employer as well as the employees. So what can you do? Well, just to finish off, let's have a look at a rough structure, if you like, of things you could do. Firstly, I think you need to have a policy in place that doesn't have to be in play all the time, if you like, but one that you can deliver quickly and efficiently at very short notice. So suddenly, if another wave of COVID bubbles, bubbles up, you can say, right, this is the policy that we're now all working to. And we thought it through and we know this is as good as we can get it. But you can turn it off and on as you need it. It doesn't need to be in play all the time. And I think it needs to look something like this. Now, before I start on this explanation, I would say that every company represented today in every sector represented today would have a different structure. This is just a starting start of a 10, if you like, or things that you should be thinking about in your infection secure structure going forward and something you should be revisiting on a regular basis. At the very centre of it, I think you need to have a vaccination and testing policy that's agreed from outset. And that you can revisit. So if you go back to our case study, they could have changed that policy, but they didn't. And that led to the problems. Now, it doesn't mean you've actually got to do vaccinations on site, although some employers, of course, will do in the future. They're not available yet privately to do so. It doesn't mean you need to do testing on site, but again, some will do so. But you need to be helping your employees to do those things. So if they need time off to go get a vaccination, give them time off. If they need to have the testing policy provided to them, provide the tests to them so they can do it. Exactly as the schools are now for kids at the moment. So have that in the centre, because if you start getting that bit right, then everything else will flow from it. Secondly, it's to build on some of the more basic stuff that took the UK a hell of a long time to get to last year and didn't help us at all. But when we got there, it's good. Hands face space, such a simple, simple message. So effective, but we didn't get there till last what, October, November, I think it was. But have that as your default option. You know, if there is another pandemic, if there is another epidemic, we're gonna to go to hands face space immediately, folks. Let's try and make as much space as we can. Where you can turn on working from home quickly and efficiently, it will protect your employees, it will protect your supply chain, and you should do it. How do we're in the fortunate position that actually we could turn on working from home a full 10 days, I think it was, before Boris Johnson announced the first lockdown. We protected our employees, we protected their families, we protected our supply chain. That was good for us and good for everybody else. Now, I appreciate not all companies can do that and not all jobs can do that, but it's worth having it in your back pocket if you can. So you can go to that, just a flick of a switch, we're now all working from home. Where you can introduce policies, and you've probably got these things free with your employee benefits anyway, folks. It's about bringing them out and using them. Introduce free services that will help your employees. So remote GP appointments. So instead of you having to go and sit in a GP surgery, passing your virus to other people and collecting their viruses back in return, most appointments can be done over the phone, through a screen. And increasingly, they are being done that way. So turn that on because that protects people again, and it's a free service for many of you, or you can add it for not much cost. Employee assistance plans are designed to be used at arm's length, but provide all sorts of practical support. So make sure employees know what they are and how to access them, and make sure it's the best you can do in that particular space. Make sure all your employees are protected. It doesn't need to be full Monty life cover, it doesn't need to be full time salary, but make sure everyone's got at least some basic life cover. Because the truth is that actually a lot of employers in the past that I've met, Say, so, look, yeah, I hear what you say, Steve. I know we need to protect our employees, but we don't want to get involved in another insurance conflict. We don't want another load of premiums each year. But actually, we will look after somebody or somebody's family if they die in our employment. And people really mean that. Employers really mean that. I've seen many employers do exactly that. But I think that's a very fragile promise. If you look back to last year, we had a total lockdown and actually employers didn't have any money coming in at all. How could they have found money? from cash flow to support a family in that situation. So give at least a basic level of life cover to everyone. Good sick pay policy, good robust sick pay policy that reflects where you are. I spoke about that earlier. And when people are off long-term with long COVID or anything else, then make sure you're doing something around protecting their income. There are policies in place to do that. Healthcare and cash plans, well, that's because the NHS, you know, which has performed magnificently, I think we'd all agree, 
over the course of the last year or so have done that at a cost and that cost is the waiting list which is currently at a record high of 4.7 million with more than 300,000 people in the UK waiting more than a year for routine treatments. Now, those routine, routine treatments, they might be routine and non-life-threatening, but it doesn't mean that a person can go to work. Or if they can go to work, they might not be able to work at full efficiency. And we need to get people back in the workplace. We need to get people efficient again. So if you can supply some sort of private healthcare initiatives, do so, because that will speed their return to work. That will help your productivity. Make sure you've got all this well communicated so that employees understand it, well governed so it's always right and well reviewed so it's kept up to date. It doesn't need to be onerous once you've set it up, but you do need to review it at least once a year just to make sure it's the best it can possibly be where you are today. And the last one, which is a big ask for any company, but make sure that your employees understand this and understand that they will actually have to do this at the drop of a hat. This is not an optional, guys. This is what we have decided we all need to do as a company should we need to go to another lockdown? Should we need to go to no more restrictions? Whatever the case may be, and we want you and expect you to comply. But if you get all that right, then you're actually in a much better place to ride the bumps in the road that may lie ahead. We need normality. We all know that. We all crave normality. But we need to understand that it's not quite as simple as we deliver vaccines, that solves the problem. It's only part of the solution. So my final thoughts before I hand back to Ian, then we take any questions there may be. Firstly, hope for the best. I'm hoping for the best. You're hoping for the best. We're all hoping for the best. But let's be pragmatic. Let's be sensible and plan for the worst. Because actually, it could easily come back. It's more likely, perhaps, than not to come back. I noticed that there was a report yesterday of some Indian variants in in UK only yesterday. So it only needs one outbreak and we could be back to square one. Introduce whatever the robust infection secure policy looks like for your business, for your sector, but make sure you have something in place that you can bring out quickly and efficiently. And when you have employee benefits in place, there will be tools there that you can use better as part of that policy. So find out what you've got and use it as best you can, communicate it as best you can, and get real value from what you're already spending on your employee benefits package, which is pretty much me done. So many thanks for listening to me drone on. I will now pass back with some relief while I take a slug of tea to Ian and we'll go from there. Thank you, folks. Oh, Steve, you're so engaging. I could just sit and listen to you for ages. You're so engaging. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. And I think it's given, uh, given employers a lot, to, uh, a lot to think about, to be quite honest. And I know, Rick, we've got three, three poll questions, haven't we? Yes, good morning. I'll, I'll launch the first one now. But does you your organisation already have a formal COVID secure policy in place? So we're talking COVID secure rather than infection secure there, folks. The, the basic, if you like, the, the vanilla as put out by the government. We'll give it another few seconds. Okay, I'll share those. Oh, well, that looks that looks impressive, doesn't it? Well, the, the yes is good, um, but I have to say the no's are not sure's, given the fact that we know that that roadmap is, is very much on and that we are going to return to the workplace, I find worrying. And actually, if you think back into the big event when you attended and we asked the same sort of question, it was the same sort of result. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, I, I genuinely think, guys, at the very least, you should have a COVID secure policy in place now. There's no excuse for not having that there. The rest of it, the stuff I was talking about as a preferred option, well, that's a different conversation, but at least get that up and running because the return to work is on. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, question two, just, here we go. Do you believe there would be more pressure on employers to provide an infection secure workplace in the future? Give that a few more seconds. There we go. Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly believe that it will definitely apply to some sectors. I think it probably already is to a degree. So if you take the care sector, 
I think it's going to be a given that you've got to have that sort of thing in place. The healthcare sector possibly as well. But I expect genuinely over time as the dust settles, as hopefully we leave COVID behind in the rearview mirror, I expect many more employers, many more sectors thinking this is a hygiene factor that we've just got to have because it's protecting our supply chain, it's protecting our employees. So it's certainly something to be aiming for. That doesn't mean you have to have it tomorrow, but it's something to be thinking about for the course of this year. Okay, and the final question, here we go. Will your organisation need to improve employee benefits to support a COVID stroke infection secure policy? <clears throat> So just to be clear, these are the bits I was talking about, things like group life assurance, income protection, remote GP, it, all those bits I touched on, many of which fall within that sort of structure. A few more still coming. Okay. There we go. Worth remembering genuinely, and I'm sort of this is against the principles of my company almost because we sell employee benefits, but worth remembering that many of the benefits you've got already will have extra features that you're not using. You're paying for them, but you're not using them. And that's really, really common. I've had several conversations this week actually with employers in exactly that position. So have a look at what you've got, roll those out, use those things better because they're good tools, but only if you tell people they're there, only if you build on them and add them into your policy. Thank you. Okay. It's all a cost though, Steve, isn't it, to employers? At a time when employers are uh, fighting for survival, many employers are fighting for survival, these um, <coughs> protections which you should have in place are going to be a cost. I mean, look at the Sainsbury's results that came out this week. You know, yeah. made terrific yeah. loss. And yet they, 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 they were doing um, absolutely fantastically during all the lockdowns. But the cost of doing fantastically far outweighed their, far outweighed their profits. And that would be, I, I would think that that's going to be paramount in a lot of employers' minds. Yeah, absolutely. And, and until the dust, re I mean, certainly one of those surveys I did last year to one of my bigger audiences, that virtually every company wanted to improve their employee benefits. But this has just gone on for so long, the pandemic. You know, if you if you roll back a year ago, yes, it was grim. Yes, we were in full lockdown. But I think we all expected to have some sort of normality June, July time. Mm. And we just never really got there. You know, I mean, yes, there was a bit of reopening, but it was only brief. So it, it may just be do what you can with what you've already got. But I say there's nearly always free tools in there that you've already got. It's just a question of using them better. I did actually also mention earlier on, can I just cover it now? I think I mentioned Chile. Did I mention Chile? I can't, yeah, you can't did, remember. yeah. But Chile, I think, is, is a very salutary lesson in not relying too much on the vaccines. Now, I, I'm not dissing the vaccine in any way, shape or form. It's got us to where we are now. It's got us to the point that we can come out of this and hopefully accelerate away from the problem. But the truth of the matter is Chile are ahead of us in a vaccine program. Now, they're a different population in a different hemisphere of the world. And it's a different vaccine. It's one that came from Beijing. But it is a vaccine that works. There's plenty of evidence to show that it works. And they are way ahead of the UK and the USA in terms of their vaccination program. They're one of the leading countries in terms of vaccinations. Yet Chile has just gone back into another lockdown. Chile's healthcare system is just under the pressure and looking like it might collapse. Because despite having that vaccine program, everyone just relied on it too much. They all went out and partied, had a good time and met people. And I get all that. I understand all of that. I, you know, we all want to do that, frankly. But because they didn't take all the other measures, they're back where they started. In fact, they're slightly worse. They're at record numbers for Chile at this point. So, yes, let, let's look forward to the benefits of the vaccine, but let's be sensible and cautious about everything we're doing here. And let's do what we can to just add in extra layers of protection so that we don't go back there. Because none of us want to go back there. I don't think any of us as employers, as individuals, or as nations can afford to go back there. You know, the economy is pretty much broken. It's a question of how we fix it, and we can't afford to go back into that dive again. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I've got three questions that people have sent sent me, actually. Can I read those out? Well, <clears> it would be interesting to get your, your views. Okay, first one. Payroll professionals have been told that they are key workers, raising the profile of the profession considerably. Yet... Haven't payroll and reward professionals always been key workers to any business? 
Indeed, aren't all workers key to the business in some way? Yes, it's, I mean, I, I, it's something I've said many, many times over the year that, you know, in any corporate machine, there are big cogs and there are small cogs. And the big cogs are the ones that make all the noise and everyone recognises. And I suppose to a degree, and you and I are, are those sort of cogs. That's the sort of thing we do. But every cog is important to the machine. You mm. take a cog out and the machine fails. Mm. Mm. And, and right now, when we need to get back to maximum productivity, right now that we need every employee doing their bit, if you lose an employee absent because of COVID or for any other condition they haven't got treated in the last year, and that delay has racked up a lot of people that have got conditions who are just not going to sort the help for whatever reason. Then that can affect everything else. So, yeah, all employees are important, payroll or otherwise. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, you mentioned co uh, long COVID. And I've got a couple of questions about long COVID, which is really interesting. Um, and, uh, first one, is it your view that long COVID poses perhaps a bigger threat to employers than COVID-19 itself? Yes, in, in, in a nutshell, yes. Uh, the, the reality is, and I'm trying not to be glib here because I appreciate there'll be people on the call who've almost certainly lost a friend or a family member. It's bound to happen with the extent of the threat we've had in the last year. But from an, if we just put our employer hats on, the truth of the matter is the vast majority of deaths have occurred in the retired population. Now, that doesn't make it any nicer. It really doesn't. But we're here as employers. We're here for the employed population, if you like. And the truth of the matter is long COVID, as it currently stands, is a far bigger risk to the employed population than COVID itself as a death rate, if you like. That said, uh, I did some figures for a presentation I did last week. And although the vast majority of deaths have occurred in the retired population, around 17% of deaths have occurred, broadly speaking, in the working age population. And if you apply that 17% to the 127,000 dead we've had, or the higher or lower figures around that, we're looking at death rates from, or death numbers, from the employed population of somewhere between 20 and 25,000 employed people could potentially have died from COVID as well. So they're both big threats, but I think long COVID is a bigger threat and it's a longer lasting threat. And therefore it's one that we need to be thinking about. And particularly, as I said earlier, at least finding out who we've got in our workforce who may have it. Because you won't know, unless they told you, you just won't know. So at least find out what's there and then see what you can do about supporting it. Yeah. Is there a lot of information out there about long COVID and the symptoms and all that kind of thing? Or, or, or maybe I just sort of don't see that kind of thing. Is there a lot of information from the government about it? From the government, very, very little. Um, they, the government only really even started acknowledging its existence. And I don't, I don't mean that glibly. I, mean, I don't think they were trying to ignore it. I just think it was quite rightly a lower priority. You know, people were dying in large numbers and whatever. But uh, only started acknowledging it is its existence about sort of September, October time, when it was already known, had been known for several months. Uh, and even now, yes, there are some pages on the government website about long COVID, but there's actually some really good support groups out there about long COVID, which are actually a much better place to start, frankly. Uh, the government have offered some long COVID clinics. They made quite a big play about that. I think it's in the budget or around the budget time. But have they reached the people suffering? No. It's the honest truth. I, I spoke to one lady recently who's got a relative in long COVID. She's in a support group of 23,000 people, all with long COVID. And not one of those 23,000 people have seen any of these government long COVID clinics. Not one. So there's a lot of information out there, but you need to scratch the surface uh, to actually find it. And then I suppose with long COVID, yes, that's absolutely going to be a problem. And then you've got the, the uh, people's mental health, which will have, have suffered you know, greatly during this uh, work, working from home. I love it. I love working from home. But um, there's some people that will, will, will have missed the social interaction and traveling to work and all that kind of thing. Their mental health will have been affected. So you've got long COVID and mental health that employers have got to consider, really. Yep. And, and all those pent up physical conditions that haven't been treated or diagnosed as well. And the longer you leave an undiagnosed condition undiagnosed, the more likely it's going to be a problem. But yeah, the mental health side, uh, YouGov survey recently suggested, uh, that I think it's something that might be wrong on this, 23 or 26% of people had seen a, a previous mental health condition come back as a direct result of COVID. But perhaps more worryingly, 17% had had the first ever mental health condition as a direct result of COVID. So that's pretty much it, going well on towards half of the working population, potentially, has got a mental health condition either come back or for the first time as a result of the last year. And you may have seen yesterday, there was quite a bit of news coverage of this uh, 
conference, it's some sort of work conference. I don't know what the conference was in Liverpool. Oh, yes, it, yeah. They were running as a sort of trial. Pilot thing, you, yeah. Yeah, which seemed a bit, A, early and B, dangerous the way they were doing it. There was no social distancing, no mask wearing, none of that. So people were actually encouraged to sort of hug and shake hands and all the rest of it, which I thought just seemed a bit odd. But a lot of the delegates they interviewed actually said they were nervous. They were mm -hmm. actually sort of circulating around the edges of the conference center rather than going into the middle. So, you know, I think that there has been a lot of damage done to people's mental health and there will be damage as people get sort of forced back to work when we're now all institutionalized to working at home. And suddenly people seem a bit scary again. We get past it as a nation, but some people travel with it. With this uh, w working from home, uh, as I say, you know, I, I do it anyway, <coughs> and, um, I, and I'm quite comfortable with it. Um, do you think employers should be moving to facilitating more working from home? I, I think they would have no choice, is, is, is the truth of the matter. Because um, employees want it, yeah, they're going to yeah. want it. But before the pandemic, it was quite a low number of employers, about one in 10, I think, from memory, were sort of thinking about it or trying to facilitate it. But now it's the best part of 70, 80 percent of employers are saying, yeah, we'll have to do it to, to a degree. Uh, it's going to be a hybrid. It's going to be a blend. It's not going to be everyone working at home all the time. Like you, I work at home anyway. That's what I do. You know, it's, mm. it's, yes, I go out and I, I do events, but and I much prefer presenting to a real audience. No offense, folks. I'm sure you're great, but it's bloody difficult presenting to a screen. Trust me. Um, so I, I prefer to present to real people and I'm sure Ian does as well but generally speaking most people don't want to work at home all the time it takes a certain sort of mindset and personality to work effectively at home which probably puts you and me in the weird category because that's us but um, not everyone likes it and an awful lot of people don't like it so it's going to be a blend but there's a big demand from employees and expectation that they can do now and why not? I mean, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. And yes, I mean, it's lovely to sort of like get up on, on, on a stage and all that kind of thing. It, it, it's lovely to do that. But I've, I've used Zoom and Teams and WebEx and GoToMeeting and all that kind of thing. And I wonder if it hasn't been just as effective, to be quite honest. I think, I think if somebody asked me to talk at a conference tomorrow in London, I think I would feel nervous about it. All yeah. the traveling and you know uh, taxis and meeting people I, I i think i would feel nervous and, and that that must be the same for a lot of employees possibly going back to the workplace yeah i i, I think it will be uh, i think actually you've hit on a very important point uh, i think when you actually look at the yougov survey on sort of future worries future mental health issues one of the big ones was traveling so be that traveling on public transport be that traveling for work purposes whatever that's the thing that's worrying people. And if you know, if you ask me to go to London tomorrow, and you know, we've got a big office in London, which theoretically I tend to go to or what once in a while, but I haven't been to for a very long time now. Um, if you ask me to go to London tomorrow, I wouldn't be very happy about doing it. And that's not because I'm I've had a vaccine, so I should be reasonably robust, you know, I'm fairly healthy and all the rest of it. But I wouldn't want to go on public transport to London at the moment. And I don't think mm. other people would. So it's it's gonna take time and Hybrid is the way to go, I think, for offering people, you know, you don't have to be in all the time, but some of the time. Well, in, in that regard, talking about hybrid, I know on, the, on the, the, the seminar where I heard you talk in March, you were talking about this uh, proposal, possible proposal about four, uh, uh, four day four day a week, working four days a week. Yeah, um, it's, it's, do you it think sounds that's... bizarre. It's, it's, one, it's one for another event because uh, I, I could talk about it. And it is quite difficult to say, look, the way to improve productivity is to ask people to do less hours. Now that strikes right now, that sounds like some crazy left wing wet dream, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> we, can all, we can all work less and, and that will help everyone. But there is a lot of evidence, historical evidence to say that actually flexible working and even working less days will actually improve the output of employees and their employers. And that's one we could certainly cover on another day because it's a big presentation. But I know when I say it glibly, people will just go, yeah, come on, that's rubbish. Um, but there is evidence, so, you know, historical evidence and current evidence to say that actually reducing people's working week will actually make them more productive, more engaged and all the other stuff as well. And that's good for everybody. But that's one for another day, I think. And, I mean, and four day a week might be absolutely fine, but not all professions. You can't say to an employee, well, actually, no, you didn't get paid on time because that was my day off. And I, yeah. didn't, I didn't release the payrolls back. Uh, yeah. indeed, so not uh, all uh, professions. No, and indeed, there are lots of jobs where it wouldn't work anyway. So if you're a truck driver, you, you, you can't 
force people to convert, you know, I'm not saying for a moment incidentally that they should do five days working for, but you can't force people to do extra hours potentially so they can take the day off because that would break the rules of being a truck driver where you can only drive for a certain number of hours a day. So yeah. it is selective, it's not for everyone, but I think in some sectors it will become a really attractive option. And indeed, when we asked at the last family employment webinar, you were at, we had about 300 employees in the room. And we said, who's interested in going to a four day week? And 2% actually said, we've done it already, which I thought was quite interesting. So, yeah. it's, you know, so there are some companies that have bit the bit the bullet and actually gone for it. Uh, whether it's worked from is a different conversation, but it can do. I've got one other question that somebody sent me and it's about um, <clears throat> uh, uh, long COVID and mental health. Do you think an employer that ignores or brushes off long COVID and mental health might endanger long-term workforce relationships with their employees? Yeah, uh, it, it, in that context, you can almost park long COVID and just say any genuine illness where the employer doesn't get it. And yeah, that, uh, well, that case study I gave you earlier on, I mean, I, I did simplify it a bit, but there was also a, a sort of subtext to it that was coming out in the media reports that some of the managers were, well, COVID doesn't matter, COVID doesn't exist, you should be here anyway. Uh, if, if you belittle genuine illness, then that will damage all sorts of things. You know, some of it may be really obvious like that one there, or some of it may be that, you know, just the employees don't trust you anymore, they don't respect you. And the moment your employees don't trust and respect the management, frankly, they're not going to be engaged. And if they're not engaged, they're not going to be productive. Because there's many ways of doing eight hours work without attributing eight hours worth of uh, output, essentially. You can yeah. be there without being engaged in outputting. So, yes, it's about recognising and trying to support people. And it doesn't have to cost money to support people. A lot of things are just, you know, the simple things in life. Thank you and try and do this and have a bit of flexibility there. All makes a difference. I think flexibility in work and workplaces will be key in the future. Um, yeah, I, I, I really, I, yeah, I really do. And uh, maybe people not working uh, from home all of the time, but going into uh, to the office one day a week, something like that. And of course, that's going to be an implication for employers. And then, of course, you've got all of these offices. It, it, I was reading about in London, all of these office blocks, they're going to turn into homes or something, wasn't it? You know, because employees don't want to return to the workplace, you know. Yeah. It's possible, but then I, th I think if you if you go down that line, why would you pay the prices in any city centre if you don't need to necessarily go to that city centre? So I, I, I'm not convinced that will happen, but then you've got lots of retail space that's going to be available as well. So it, and anything could happen in the next half hour. Uh, I don't think the current property bubble will continue being a property bubble because once the stamp duty ends, that will force prices down and that may change a lot of people's ideas about, oh, we're going to convert that into property, but who knows? I think what's been really interesting, what's been a real eye opener for, uh, for, for payroll professionals, reward professionals, is we never thought that we could do it. We never thought we could run a payroll from home. We never thought that we could interview and recruit from home. We never thought we could discipline uh, from home. We've all got so used to doing things on Zoom and Teams and, and all that and email that actually it's, it's possible. And maybe that will really change the way that we work in the future. I think it was going to happen anyway, but maybe the pandemic has exacerbated or advanced the move. What would you think so? I first wrote on this, literally, I think it was about two weeks into the first lockdown. So, I mean, it's about this time last year, if not earlier last year. And I said at that point, bearing in mind, we were only expecting three months of lockdown. I said, by the time people go back in three months' time, there'll be plenty of people that have proved that they can work at home as effectively or more effectively. Not all people, because a lot of people just can't do it for whatever reason. Either their job doesn't allow them, or they just they're just not that sort of person. But there'd be loads of people that have proved they can do it. Now that was with three months. We're now 13, 14 months in. I've not been back to an office in 14 months at all. So mm. I've done all my work from home. If that's your case, if you've done that, you've delivered. Your company's still delivering for 14 months. You don't need to go back. I mean, that's the fact. And it's going to be an interesting dynamic about employee-employer relationships. Employers that force employees back might well, quite rightly, say, well, I'll go somewhere else where they will let me work remotely. You know? So mm. there, there is going to be a drive, without question, uh, because employees think they've proved they can do it, and in many cases they have proved they can do it. 
And I and I don't think that the working from home and, and doing things via Zoom and Teams, I don't think it's any less efficient. And, and I think people were worried about that. I mean, I, mean, I do training and I, I, um, I, I've got something this afternoon, I'm doing an interview this afternoon. It's no less efficient, <coughs> excuse me, me doing it via Zoom than if I was sitting in an office with Which, a face mask on. It's, it's potentially loads more efficient because you're, you're not incurring any costs going there, any time to get there. Uh, you know, I could, in theory, run several webinars like this in a day to several different audiences. I mean, I, I wouldn't because that's just too much, but but it could be done. Whereas if yeah. you're out on the road, there's a limit. You can see how many webinars you could do in a day because you've got to get to places and all the rest of it. So it, it saves the employers money as well. So Absolutely. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, and I think many companies, Bacon has been saved over the last year by the fact that whilst some of their income may have gone south, their actual expenses of employing people has also gone south. So actually, yeah. there's, there's many companies that are actually sort of just as well off as they were, but just in a different way to what they expected. Because I'm like you. I mean, I used to travel all over the place talking out, training here and talking there. But I haven't left my home since February last year. Yeah. I mean, I haven't been shopping. Don't get me yeah. right. I haven't stayed yeah, there, yeah, but yeah, I've yeah. shopping. But uh, you know, I haven't bike, but, yeah. inc <laughs> incurred any expenses for my employer. And, and I'm sure that they're grateful for that. But uh, the, the, the most important thing for me is I, I, I'm sure that what I do hasn't been any less effective. No, no, I I'd, I'd, I'd agree. Uh, it, it can be done. It's just um, when it comes to presentations, I'd rather see some real people, please. Well, true. And my dry cleaning bill is zero. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, there'll be a few, few dry cleaners going out of business, link. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, listen, Steve, thank you so much. Rick, have you got any other, have you got any questions there? No, that's it. No more questions. No. Do you know, Steve, I think you could just talk for hours, couldn't you? <laughs> oh, great. I'm so, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. I think it's absolutely fantastic, uh, 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 fascinating. And I think it's a real eye opener for, for employers. Now, with regards to the, the branches going forward, please do let me know or Rick or I realize no of anything else that you want to discuss, any sort of like burning topic. And then we'll make sure that we cover that on a future brunch for the next one. Can you flip forward the next slide? Because I can't remember the date. Of course I can, sorry. Is it the 20... Yeah. 27th of May. of May. Yeah. So please do join I Realize on the 20, 27th of uh, May 2001. Email me if there's anything that you think that you want to discuss, anything that you're unclear of. Email me or email I Realize and tell us because these are these are branches that we hold for you for engagement with the profession. But until then, thank you so much, Steve. Thank you so much. And, and thank um, you for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, and take care until next month. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, folks. Bye.